Amen. All right. Let's look. Part five. Let me just see it. it says theocracy, and we'll end by Saul and David. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. All right, so from the top, I, I, I've been through the lesson. So it's not too controversial. There's not too many spanners in the works that I'll be throwing through. This is uh, stories we're generally familiar with, so there won't be too many extra added juicy parts to add in. But let's start from the top. Redemptive plan. It says God's promise from the outset was one of redemption. After the Adamic fall of mankind, the fall of Adam. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So this is a very cryptic little verse found in Genesis chapter 3 that for like many people just sounded like so weird. It just had like no reference to anything, especially in the Garden of Eden. And it's only until Jesus Christ actually died for our sins where we could look back again at that verse and kind of add meaning to it. So this is what that verse means. Um, the woman's seed is Christ, and he would bruise the head of the serpent, which is Satan, and bring deliverance from sin to all who believe. And Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that little cryptic verse was simply that the serpent would bruise Jesus' heel, and that's kind of what happened because he, he, he was hurt, he was punished, and he did die. But he didn't die and stay dead. He actually rose again. And in that, defeated death and defeated the dominion of the devil. And then what it says here also is that the seed of the woman would actually crush the head of the serpent. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ done and is still yet to do in the future. Completely destroy and make null and void the devil, the serpent. All right, so that verse in Genesis chapter 3 is talking about the fall. It's talking about the fall of man, and in that it already gives us a plan coming forward of redemption. And that redemption is through Jesus Christ. Okay, and now we're going to move on to the actual meat of the lesson, which is the first kings of Israel. So it's talking about theocracy. Theocracy uh, comes from the two words. The first one is theos. What does theos mean? God. It's a Greek word for God. Um, it's the ruling of God. When God called and established the nation of Israel to be his chosen nation, he promised that a royal monarch with a divine nature would one day reign as the Messiah. It says in brackets, Christ means Messiah, God's anointed one. So the word Christ, you can maybe write somewhere there, comes from a Greek word Christos. It's Christ with an O-S at the end, Christos. And that word is translated from the Hebrew, Messiah where we get our word, Messiah. So Jesus Christ actually means Jesus Messiah. Jesus is his personal name, given by Mary and Joseph, and also by the angel. You shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So this was his name, like I am Raymond. Messiah is a title. Christ is a title. It's the Messiah, and his name is Jesus. All right, And they both mean the anointed one. And that's what Jesus is. The anointed one. So God promised that uh, from Israel there would be a Messiah that would come and he would reign on the throne and his uh, kingdom would last forever and ever. All right. However, the nation became restless and demanded that they become like other nations with their own king. God or Yahweh, or the old translation is Jehovah, had appointed judges to rule over Israel. But they insisted that like the other nations, they wanted their own king. In 1 Samuel 8, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, Samuel the prophet, and they said, No, but we want a king to rule over us. So after Moses entered the promised land with the Israelites, he ruled, and then eventually at the ripe old age of 120, I don't know if I want to live to 120. <laughs> uh, I think me and Chris were talking about maybe living to 90 or 100. I think that's probably my real figure at 100. But he was 120 and he died and was buried secretly by God. No one knows where he was buried. And then after him, who took over as the leader of Israel? Joshua. So Joshua took over and he was the one that actually entered into the promised land. Moses never entered into the promised land. God took him over to the mountain and he showed him the promised land and said, you're never going to get there. And he died and was buried on that same mountain. So Joshua became the leader of Israel. He led the people into Israel. He conquered 
the, the land over many years of a military campaign, busy killing all the giants and conquering the land for them. And then after he died, God raised up judges. Hence the book of Judges. Well done. <laughs> Can anybody name three judges? Name one. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll tell you the first one. Samson. Anybody know Samson? Uh, Gideon. Gideon was God, the 300. Then you get Deborah. Deborah was uh, the awesome leader. I love the story of Deborah. Um, you get other guys called Ehud. Have you ever heard of Ehud? Sorry? Samuel was, yeah, but he came after Samson. I'm talking about mainly just the book of Judges. Yeah. There's a guy called Jephthah. There's a whole lot of beautiful guys in there. And the book of Judges for me is one of the most exciting books in the Bible. It's full with action and adventure. And I'm that kind of a person. All right. I love action Tom Cruise movies. All right. <laughs> action and adventure. And if you haven't read the book of Judges, please spend some time reading that book. It's just so amazing. And kind of we think of Judges and then we think of Samson. And maybe Gideon and maybe Deborah. You know, maybe that's where we get. But there's 16 judges in total, and they were and they had awesome stories, the most amazing stories of encouragement and, and intrigue and plot twists. So that's just an amazing book, the book of Judges. It ends with Samson, and Samson I still feel gets up the short end of the stick. He's always regarded as like a bad guy. <laughs> a womanizer, he goes around with prostitutes and kills everyone. Uh, and uh, if you read the book of Judges and the story of Samson. I think if you just read it with an open mind, you'll actually understand that it's, it's actually more of a very sad story uh, about this guy who just had a lot of power as what we think he was. Yeah. So Samson, I think he just he gets um, slandered in many books and, and commentaries about him. And I think the story is actually a beautiful one. Uh, but he falls in love with a woman and then she gets killed and the father gets killed and he takes revenge on her. And then he falls in love with another lady and her name's Delilah. And Delilah is not necessarily also even and wicked. She was a woman that he fell in love with. They had a partnership. Unfortunately, uh, she liked money, like most women do. There's nothing unusual there. <laughs> um, and then his story obviously ends when, he, when he's like, taken as a prison. His eyes are gouged out. And then eventually um, kills himself and kills a lot of the Philistines. Sorry, Leon. That's <laughs> like Donald Trump. <laughs> no, Don John's bad, all right? <laughs> Samson. And then after Samson dies, that, that ends the story of the judges. And after him, God raises up the final judge, which will be Samuel. I think somebody mentioned Samuel. And that's the guy we spoke about here. Samuel is raised up. He's a guy that was dedicated by his mother Hannah to the tabernacle. Um, she couldn't conceive. And then God said, okay, you'll bless her with the son. And when she had the son, his name was Samuel. And then she dedicated him back to the temple, to the, the tabernacle. And Samuel means to hear because God heard her pray. Shema El, God hears Shema El. And then he, he grew up in the, he was like the last judge. He became not in the last judge, but also the first prophet to the kings. He was the one who would then anoint the kings. So the people of Israel said, we don't want judges no more. We're sick of all these Debras and Gideons and people. We want a king. All the other nations have kings. We also want a king. And then God through Samuel went back to them and said, you really don't want a king because the king, kings are bad and they're wicked and evil. And they're going to enslave your people. They're going to take all your money and all your people are going to be, your men are going to be sent off to war and die in war. So God actually warned them that, you know, that's, let, let me rule you. Let, me as God, let, let me just do what I'm doing. But they said, no, no, we want a man over us. Samuel was the one who would then go and anoint the first king of Israel. And his name is Saul. So let's go back to our paper. It says, Saul, the first king of Israel. God granted Israel their wish, and they chose Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. So Saul celebrated his coronation as king, and the people shouted, God, save the king. The British people coined this phrase, and to this day they use this in their anthem, God, save the queen. And now today it's obviously back to God, save the king back again because of King Charles. I read 1 Samuel. However, Saul failed in his mandate, and God purposed to replace him with another guy called David. So we just kind of finished the series on the first three kings of Israel. So it should hopefully be fresh in your mind. But Saul was chosen uh, by God. And the, the biggest thing about Saul, excuse the pun, was his height. And he, he was tall, dark, and handsome. And he was a perfect leader. The Israelites wanted someone who would lead them into battle. That was their mandate for God. Give us a king and their 
criteria was we want someone to lead us into battle. So when they saw Saul, it was, oh, this is a guy. He's tall and he's dark and he's obviously muscular. So this is a guy that will lead us into battle. He may have had the physical attributes, but he lacked everything on the inside. He was actually a coward. When it came to fighting Goliath, who was the one hiding in his tent? It was Saul. All right. So he had the physical attributes, but inside he, he had nothing that God wanted, that the people of Israel actually wanted. He was a coward. He was arrogant. He, was, he disobeyed God at every turn. And eventually, his life ended very, very tragically um, by falling on his own sword. He took his own life. All right, and then with that, then God anoints another guy called David. So right at the bottom, it says, David anointed. Luke says, and he will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him a throne of his father David. This is talking about Jesus, and it's talking about him ruling from the throne of David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will not end. The Spirit of God came upon David over the page. All right, let me just. David, as, as Samuel the prophet anointed him as the future king. And we read that in 1 Samuel 6. But the Spirit departed from King Saul. So in the Old Testament, God used to give his Holy Spirit, and he used to also take his Holy Spirit away. It used to be given for a certain purpose, time, and season, or whatever that was, or whatever that person needed. Um, Saul had the Holy Spirit. He started great. I mean, he, he had the Holy Spirit in him. He started to prophesy. He done awesome. He started awesome. And then eventually he started to disobey God and get very proud, uh, proud, proud and arrogant. And then God took his Holy Spirit away from him. When uh, David was anointed, God gave him his Holy Spirit. Today it's a bit different. God doesn't give and take his Holy Spirit. He gives all believers his Holy Spirit, and he doesn't just take that away. The only time God can take his Holy Spirit away from you as a Christian is if you reject him. Then God is obligated then to take what is his back again because of that rejection. But other than that, Christians, well, I believe we once saved, always saved. You cannot lose your salvation, and you cannot lose the Holy Spirit. So as a Christian, even if you sin and disobey God, God doesn't say, oh, Raymond, that's it. Take my Holy Spirit away from me. You. you you're now a sinner again until further notice. And then when you become a Christian again, then he gives his Holy Spirit back again. That's not how God works. God gives us his Holy Spirit. He says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Sealed means forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. um, so the only other thing about Saul is that when God took his spirit away from him, God actually gave him an evil spirit that tormented him. And it's interesting because it, it, what, this evil spirit didn't come from what Satan. It came from God. It says God gave this evil spirit to him. It shows two things. One is that God is in control of everything, the good and the bad. Even Jesus, when he was on earth, he had control of the demons. He spoke to them and he sent them where they will. And God has control of the demons, uh, well, whatever the familiar spirit is. And also God can use them for whatever purpose he wants to. In this case, he used it to actually torment Saul. And if you read like the context of the story, it's actually weird because the evil spirit was sent to uh, – Torment Saul and make, make him mad. And then in that, he wanted someone to help him in his torment to play music to him. And who would that be? David. Yeah. And then David comes into the scene. So that's another plot twist. And then while David's there, because of the evil spirit, he gets mad and throws a spear and wants to kill David. So it's weird. So God gave the evil spirit for a reason, but it, it, it didn't just play out with one thing. It had consequences all over the place. And we must remember that in life. Everything that we do has a consequence. Everything has a ripple effect. There's something out there called the butterfly effect. Have you heard of that before? Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing concept. It's basically meaning that everything we do has a ripple effect on the people around us, the people around them, this community, this city, this country, this world. And the, the butterfly effect comes from the fact that in PE, there's a butterfly flapping its wings, and that little wind is causing a tornado in Hawaii. You understand? Because of the effect it will have a repercussions of the world. So it's the same here. Just because one thing happens, God does one thing, there's repercussions and consequences all the time. And we must understand that about our life too. Everything we do or say affects somebody else, and therefore affects somebody else, and eventually, and especially even worse today with social media and stuff like that, it is the global village. If we do one thing today on WhatsApp, everybody knows around the world. Who knows what's happening with the elections in America? Everybody knows, except for me. I really don't know what's happening. <laughs> I'm like, who's winning? Who knows? Trump's winning. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> 
Okay, so David is raised up as the next king of Israel. And I also find that very ironic. Uh, I, I just spoke about that now, but think about this. Saul is the, he is still the king. God rejected him as a king, but he was still the legitimate king of Israel. And here he was in his palace, ruling of Israel for another 30 years, Saul would rule. And in that same palace throne room would be David, the new king of Israel, and he would be the other side of the palace playing the harp. So in this one area, we have the two kings, legitimate anointed kings of Israel in one area. And David would not be a king for another 30 years. It was only until Saul would die that David would then have the right, legitimate right, to take over the throne. Okay, so it says about the tribe of Judah, it says God's promise of a redeemed and ruler would come through the lineage of the tribe of Judah. David, the youngest son of Jesse, was a descendant of Judah. And it says in Matthew, and Matthew it talks about the lineage and genealogy of Jesus Christ from the tribe of Judah. That is why Jesus has a legitimate right to become the king of Israel, because he's from the tribe of Judah. All right, if you read about the, if you do a Bible study on the lineage and the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ in both Matthew and Luke, it's actually very, very interesting. And you'll see that there was actually a curse on one of the people in the line, which is why there were no kings after that. But Jesus had the right. He could go to the temple and show that, listen, he's from the tribe of Judah and therefore have a right to be the king of Israel. So when he came in and said he's a Messiah, it wasn't that they actually questioned that because they could just go back to the temple and prove it. So no one said, no, you don't have the right. They were just questioning him because he also claimed that he was God. That was actually the, the main fight that the Jews had with him. All right, he was from the tribe of Judah. That's why we call Jesus the lion from the tribe of Judah. And then it goes into another part called David and Goliath. This is obviously a familiar story. Considered one of the most memorable Bible stories is the victory of David over Goliath. David's age did not impede him, his confidence in facing this daunting challenge. There are great practical lessons to be gleaned from the narrative. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17 is all about David and Goliath. And it says that his age mustn't be a an impedance to him because he was younger than 20. He had to be 20 to be in the army, which was what his brothers were at that time. So he was, we don't know how old he was, but he was younger than 20. So he could have been a young lad, about maybe 12, or 13, or 14. He could have been 17, 18, or 19. Right? The Bible doesn't really say. So it just says we know that he wasn't 20 because he wasn't actually in the army. So he was younger than that, and he was the youngest of his brothers. All right, then it says there's some beautiful spiritual applications, which Bible, study, Bible studies don't normally do. You know that all the lessons we've done, it's all Bible, Bible. This is kind of the first time we really get a, a spiritual application out of the story, which is awesome. So let's read that. It says, don't let the size of your problem intimidate you. Goliath was a giant, anywhere between six and eight foot. A door is six foot, so a door and a half would be about eight foot. So this is how big this giant was, and he wasn't just tall and scrawny. He was really, really big and buff. So don't let the size of your problem intimidate you. doesn't matter what size you are. You can still overcome your problems because God is with you. It says you can, through the Lord, overcome and defeat the giants in your life, whatever that giant is. So the story of David and Goliath shows us that we can also defeat our giants, whether, whether it be a relationship problem health issue, a financial burden, whatever the giant is, with the Lord we can overcome. Faith is believing that God can make the impossible possible. When Goliath came out shouting his odds, everyone hid in their tents because in their mind it was impossible. How could anybody kill this guy? With man, things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. Don't rely on conventional methods. Saul's armor for David was not suitable for the challenge. I think it's another thing that is maybe just um, misconceived when, when we kind of think of David being as a real small boy, like a 10 year old boy, and then Saul gives him his outfit to put on, and it just it doesn't, it's too big for him. But that may not necessarily be the case because if you read the text, it wasn't that it didn't fit him, he wasn't used to it. All right, David said I, he doesn't, uh, he's never been to war before, he's never wore armor before, and even in his. Uh, Previous fights and stuff that he had, he never wore this either. So it wasn't that it didn't fit him. It says very clear that he was not used to it. All right. Um, and then the other thing was, if he was like 18 or 19, we also got to understand that David um, had previous fights. Looking after the sheep, he had other fights with other animals. Anybody want to name two of those animals? The lion and a bear. Now, 
I don't know how many of you have ever fought with being a lion before. <laughs> All right. And in his fights defending the sheep, he used to fight lions and bears. All right. I wouldn't do that. Not in a million years. All right. So it shows that to actually defeat a lion and a bear, and he'd done this with his hands. This wasn't like with a slingshot. Which shows that he will need strength behind him. So I see David as a very good looking guy because it says he was handsome. He was about 18 or 19 years old and he was buff, man. Forget Malcolm, all right? <laughs> this guy, I, I think he had, he had some sort of a weight on him because, you know, a small guy wouldn't be able to attack a lion in a bear. A bear. Have you ever seen the size of a bear before? So I think he was, he was a, a very strong handsome, maybe even a tall guy. And it wasn't that that armor didn't fit him. Also remember Saul was very tall. So his armor probably wouldn't fit many people anyway. But it, I think it, it probably did fit him. I think he just wasn't used to it. He was saying, listen, this is not how I do things. I fight with my hands, man. I get down, I get dirty. Norman? It's still big though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think grizzlies are probably six foot Eight foot. I don't know, normal big bears are huge, but even a small bear, I, would, I wouldn't even fight a baby bear. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for that, yeah. But still, it's a bear, all right. So he didn't use the, the conventional methods. He actually just used his slingshot. David came in the Lord's name. He says, "You come to me with a, sh a sword and a spear, and I come to you in the name of the Lord." One of the most inspirational, uh, brave heart monologues I've ever heard in the Bible. Don't let negative people dissuade you from your mission. When he got there, he said, who's this guy shouting me? Oh, and everyone said, oh, David, just be quiet. Why don't you just go home and look after the sheep? And then he said, I can do it. He said, no, you can't. You're just a baby. You're just you're a small guy. What, what do you want with us here in the army? So they just kept on trying to dissuade him out of his mission. And he was very adamant that he could take this guy. <laughs> so hats off to this guy for his confidence that he could. And also, if you think of it, a young, strong teenager, like a young man, uh, we'd, we'd probably still have a bit of, uh, yeah, I can do this, a bit of arrogance because all kids are like that. They know everything. They're the strongest people ever. Anybody like in his pu puberty ages below 14, um, it, it, they, they won't have the confidence to do this. I don't see a 12-year-old kid wanting to take on Goliath. It's just if children aren't like that. But a young man, a strong, big, buff young man, yeah, I know he can take him on to show off his stuff. It says, David prepared himself for the conflict. Always be ready to face the trials and challenges of life with courage and faith. And he was prepared not only emotionally and spiritually, but physically because he went to get those stones. So as he was walking towards Goliath, the thing that people misunderstood was that, or the people at the time, was that he wasn't going to fight him in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. He had a slingshot. And I heard someone tell me that, you know, he wasn't really perturbed about the size of the giant. The bigger Goliath was, the easier it was for him to hit him with the slingshot, right? And I like that because it shows that he, he had a whole different approach to fighting Goliath. The bigger he was, the better because there's a better chance of him hitting with the slingshot. And that slingshot, it was, we just think of a catty, you know, or you know, catty's in good days anymore. Uh, but uh, that thing was actually, they, they said it was like a bullet, like a, from a, a, a 45 revolver bullet, whatever. That's a fast that thing would have hit you. So you can think of somebody basically shooting you on your forehead <laughs> with a bullet. And that's how fast this thing was. And it was hard to do that. I mean, it, it wasn't just, yeah, I mean, you aren't doing it. You should swing it around like this. And that thing used to fly. Then when he let that thing go, that thing went like a bullet. And it hit him right on the forehead and knocked him out. Um, how many stones did he take with him? He took five stones, yeah. And people speculate, I do say speculate in bold letters, um, it could have just been that he took, because people misunderstand, he took five. So either he could have missed, because I think that's logic. I mean, he could have missed the first one, so he had backup. Uh, but people think, hey, if you go out in the name of the Lord, you'll never miss. So the one was good enough. So he should have just taken one, but he didn't. I think that in naturally speaking, he could have missed or maybe just hit his arm or something, so he had backup. The other theory is that it was for his brothers. According to 2 Samuel 21, it talks about other giants, the brothers of Goliath. All right, and then the last one was he oh, take on the whole armor of God. I don't really get that comment because he didn't have armor. But anyway, we should take the whole armor of God when we fight our battles. All right, and that is the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of peace, and the belt of truth. And I don't know what the other one was. Oh, the sword of the spirit. There we go. All right, so we got the whole armor of God. Okay, so that's the story of David and Goliath, a beautiful spiritual application to us.
can be used all the time. I don't think it's too much. As I said, we kind of know the story generally. And I do encourage you to go back to 1 Samuel 17, 16, 17, 18. And in the week, just go read it again. Because I think sometimes we have our own preconceived ideas from Sunday school and ministers and Bible studies of what there's always seen in the movies. Like the one I remember was uh, the Richard Gere, King David. Anybody seen that? <laughs> um, so, and, and when we read the story, it's actually a little bit different. Generally, it's the same, but I mean, there's, there's details in there that we never saw before. So I encourage you to just read 1 Samuel 17 again, the entire story, and you'll see some beautiful truths coming out there that you probably maybe didn't see before. All right, and then he knocks him down and he kills him. How did Goliath die? So it was either the stone or the beheading, yeah. Because the Bible says that he took a sword and cut his head off. So it's either that the stone killed him, Bible doesn't really, it's not too clear. Either the stone killed him and he died and he took the sword just to finish the job to make sure, okay, just in case, he's just going to make sure that this guy's not going to get up. All it was that he just knocked him and he's like un unconscious and then he took the sword to kind of finish the job. All right. But anyway, those are two things. Um, definitely cut his head off. I think that's the part that they leave out in the Sunday school lessons. <laughs> he took a sword and he chopped this guy's head ah! Yeah. All right. Then the last part is about this bond of loving relationship between Jonathan and David. David and Jonathan entered into a covenant. Jonathan is Saul's son. And obviously growing up in the palace um, under Saul, he, he became friends with uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, and they became very, very good friends. They entered into a covenant, and in this covenant, they symbolically exchanged roles. David and Jonathan's identities were knit together. It says this in 1 Samuel 18, um, this is the, the very next chapter after David and Goliath. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, um, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. It's interesting to use that word soul there. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off his robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor and even his sword with his bow. And belt. So there is a nice spiritual application to this, but they were very good friends and they didn't make a commitment to each other. They actually cut each other on the hand, shook hands to indicate blood brothers. I don't know if you've ever done that growing up, the, the old guys with your best bud, you've cut yourself. Yeah, we blood brothers now. Uh, they exchanged clothes, um, showing that they were very closely knit. And I like that idea that they were, they, they were knit in their souls. It's kind of, for me, a soulmate. I, I believe in soulmates. I don't, I don't think it's biblical, but I believe that there's soulmates out there for us. Maybe that's where you find your wife or whatever, or this person that you just got a connection with. Out of like 10 people, let's say even 50 people, they'll, you'll like all of them and talk to all of them, but there will be one you'll have a special connection to. Is it only me or do you, can you guys testify to that? You, okay, sure. So it is, <laughs> it's the same as maybe your wife. Like my wife and I, we know we soulmates because it was love at first sight. We just had a connection and we could talk about things, um, even sitting next to each other, not talking. Uh, it's still we were together. So and, and we have that not only with our wives but with other females or with other men. Believe it or not, men have that same relationship with other men. And I'm not talking about in that way. I'm talking about in a real relationship. I mean, uh, the, the men will know this. Growing up, you'll have friends that you just connect to. I had a friend from primary school all the way through the ministry. Uh, it was just, uh, he was different from the rest. We connected. We, we, we could like, finish each other's sentences. We liked the same movies, the same everything. Uh, we just had a special, special connection with one another. And it still happens today. Um, and even when I'm talking to ladies, and you know I love the ladies, but uh, uh, there will be special ladies out there that I've just got a special connection to. Um, uh, like my wife, you know, uh, a connection like that, but, but not in the same way, obviously. But uh, you have people out there that you've got this soul connection with. And that's why it is that even after people get divorced or they separate from their partners, they find someone else and, and they, they fall in love with that person even more than the, the, the ex-wife. And, and why? It's a soul connection with that person. It just takes a long time to find that soul connection. Sometimes we've got to hit our head a couple of times and go around the bush. But this is what Jonathan and David had. And some people today, they have this like, very weird saying. They call it a bromance. Have you heard of that? A bromance. It's a romance with a brother. All right? <laughs> and you know, it's, it's just guys. And that's where we get guys connect to each other, man. We, it's, we can't 
tell our wives everything and our partners everything. But we can go to the a club or whatever with a friend and there we can spend like four hours talking to our best friend it's just because we got a connection that's called a bromance ladies have you got that it's called a bromance <laughs> and what people skew this they, they 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 take this loving relationship between david and jonathan and they they wickedly twist it and it doesn't become a, a loving spiritual bromance it becomes a homosexual relationship and that's not what it is not in my wildest dreams, if I've read this, would I have ever think there's anything intimate with David and Jonathan. So it just shows that the, the world will take things in the Bible and twist it to accommodate their own opinions. And that's wrong. Right? We can't do that. If it was in the Bible, you would have seen it. But it's not like that. It was just a very, very loving relationship between Jonathan and David. All right. Then the last part says this is a love relationship we have with the Lord. This is a spiritual application. He loved us before we loved him. Hallelujah. He exchanged roles with us and carried our sins to Calvary. What Jonathan done was he was the prince in line to be the king. He was royal. He took off his robes and gave it to David. That's what Jesus done for us. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords. And when we became saved, he clothed us with everything he has, with his righteousness, his goodness, even his royalty. We are sons and daughters of the king. So that's another application. Um, it says the sign of this bond was normally signified through the cutting of the right hand, and it is likely that David and Jonathan clasped their right hands, allowing the exchange of blood. That signifying an exchanged identity. And again, this is what Jesus did through the shedding of his blood. He, he shed his own blood so we may live. And now we become blood brothers with Jesus, um, all brothers and sisters of our Heavenly Father. The herdsman became the prince, and the prince a herdsman. Jesus Christ left up the riches of heaven to become poor, and in that we are poor and destitute, and because of Jesus, we become rich in him. I think I'm going to do this on a sermon coming up soon, <laughs> because it's pretty deep. Uh, but yeah, that's what the spiritual application is. And then it says right at the end, David and Jonathan had a very special friendship and a love for one another, just as brothers would have. They respected the Lord and each other. We, too, should truly love one another as brothers and sisters of Christ. Here we go. Amen. So that is the end of the story. I said there's not too much stuff. We know the story generally. It's just talking about the royal line, the first king of Israel being Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin. David was from the tribe of Judah. So you all get naught for your test coming up at the end of the term. That was your prelim to the exam coming up at the end of the term. Uh, you know, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and then he was rejected by God, then God chose David. And to, that's why Jesus comes to the line of David, not anywhere near Saul. After Saul came, uh, David anointed as the, the young boy to become the next king. And then who became the third king of united Israel? Solomon. David's son through Bathsheba. All right, and he became the, and the three are important because they're the first, not only the first three kings of Israel, which is really a big thing, um, they are the first, the only three kings of a united Israel, the whole land itself. After Solomon, it was divided, and then it went down south. All right, so that's why those three are important. And always remember them. Saul was one from Trouble Benjamin, rejected by God. David, definitely the greatest king Israel ever had. He had that one little issue with that Sheba. Ah, we'll put that aside for now. And then his son Solomon, at his greatest and height, had the greatest empire ever. He was the richest man in the world, the wisest man in the world. The borders of Israel extended from the Euphrates, from the river to the sea. Have you heard of that before? <laughs> from the river to the sea and from Egypt up to Lebanon. Uh, and that, So the height of the, the glory of Israel was with Solomon. But he wasn't the greatest king. For me, the greatest king would be David. Um, because of his heart was turned towards God. Uh, Solomon, he, his heart eventually started wavering and he turned his heart away from That's what the Bible says. He wasn't fully devoted. He believed in Yahweh. He, he, he did worship him to a degree, but his heart was turned away. All right. So in with, with uh, reference to Israel, Solomon took them to the greatest heights. But as kingship, David would probably go down as the greatest king. And I think Jews still regard him as the greatest king still today. King David. I've actually been to the the coffin of King David. It's kind of it's very revered. 
and sacred to go into that area where David is laid down. All right, so there we go. Any questions regarding the kings of Israel?